He's taken over a, a month ago, and he's doing well. He's got a DAPA, uh, one of those formal methods DAPA grant, right? We got the news. He got the news yesterday, so that is very good. Yeah. And Ovidu had his PhD. Did his PhD at Notre Dame. He's built a very strong yeah. group. It's uh, in. Uh, in computational geometry, right? Geometry, yes. Yes, and uh, my advisor is from Purdue, actually. He got his PhD there, and I do have some friends at Purdue, too. Mm -hmm. From, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if, uh, you know, they are still there, actually. I have not checked recently, but uh, Mike Catala, for example. Yes, Mike, yes. Uh, he's Mike, yes, yes. here. Yeah, could he's do. also in cybersecurity, right? That's his main research now. Yeah. Good to hear that yeah. he's still there. Yeah, because in our department, uh, since there are so many security people, everyone who joins ends up doing some work in security. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and I can see why. So, uh, yeah, who else? Purdue, I mean, you all have many faculty now, Elisa, right? At Purdue? Yeah, we have been giving a lot of positions because uh, uh, we have the highest number of undergrad enrollments. Uh, yeah. So, because we, the, you know, we have so much demand that they are giving us a lot of positions and also a lot of uh, teaching only positions. So, we already have five teaching only professors. Yes. And, we, and they are not easy to find, actually. We have a search also this year. Because it seems that the, the, there is high demand from many institutions for teaching only faculty. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think at least now, they yeah. help with the, you know, do the courses like first and second years very professionally. You know, they're really good and really just to do teaching. So. So Michelle's joined. Michelle. Um, She's recording, she said, so that's great. Michelle does all our, she's our web manager. She's fantastic. She takes all the photographs. That's why I'm all dressed up for Michelle to take photographs. <laughs> she does a good job. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's like I'm giving the talk. <laughs> Babani, you are always dressed up. I know that. <laughs> no, but not, not to, if you see me during the daytime, daytime meetings, it's just awful. I mean, I would never have imagined I'd be looking like this in meetings, but yeah. what to do when we are working from home? I mean, I just yeah. all rules are gone. Yeah. <laughs> so I just wanted to wear my home clothes. Then I decided, no, Elisa is giving, she's a Thank important you. person, so I have to dress up. Oh, so okay, that's why. Well, you. Yeah, I mean, Thank you. I appreciate this. You are very nice. Yeah. So uh, we quite a few people over you. They're all joining. Yes, and I, I expect uh, even more. I'm yes. sure them all join. We still have a couple of minutes before we get right. started. I mean, and it's also. Yeah, you want to say hi to Elisa? I don't know where Ivo is. Uh, hi, uh, how hey. are you doing? Yeah, thank you. I'm doing fine. How about you? I haven't seen you in years. I haven't been to oh. Purdue in many, many years. Exactly. I still remember your talk. It was a really fascinating talk. Yeah, it was a long time ago, I know. And unfortunately, uh, Murat cannot be here because Murat is uh, traveling, I think, on his way back he's from Turkey. So he's traveling. Yeah. And so that's why he couldn't be here. He's traveling, yeah, Tuesday. He thought it was Thursday. So he's on his way and he'll be coming, I think, tomorrow night. Yeah, he sent me an email telling me he was traveling back from Turkey, yes. And, uh, okay, Karen, it must not one. be easy. It must not be easy to take a, a, a trip like that, I would yeah. say, these days, with all these restrictions. And, right. So. Yeah. I don't know when it's all going to end, but... Uh, Hopefully, we won't get the Delta Plus. That's what I'm hoping. Okay, so I think she's recording. It's 7 o'clock. So, do you want to set up? Yes. So, uh, I would like to, to formally welcome uh, Professor Elisa Bertino and uh, to thank her for being so uh, graceful uh, in accepting our invitation to give this talk. I know that she's a very busy person and uh, 
Over the years, I heard about uh, Elisa again and again. I know that she is a friend of our department, CSR TUTD, and uh, we are a friend of hers and a friend of uh, Purdue department for sure. We hire quite a few faculty from Purdue. Uh, in fact, uh, faculty meaning PhD students after they got their PhD, they came to us as uh, faculty. And I'm looking forward for the day when this is going to reverse. We graduate PhD students and Purdue is going to hire them. <laughs> Might have a little bit to go until then. But thank you very much, Elisa. And um, you see here uh, Professor Bhavani Tuasima, of course, and you know her very well. But we do have here also Karen Mazidi. And she is uh, one of the lead organizers of this uh, series of uh, events, Grace Hopper, which uh, we had it running for quite a while now was started some years ago, I communicated to you. So I'm going to let Karen here actually run the show and, uh, and take it over from here. Thank you Karen, very please. much. Yeah. Karen. Well, let me just say a welcome to everyone um, to our great series of lectures, which began back in 2015 as a way to encourage women in computer science and related fields. And it began when some, uh, some of our female professors came back from Grace Hopper Conference. That was the initial motivation. And Bhavani was actually our inaugural speaker. So I will turn it over to Bhavani to introduce our guest speaker today. Thank you very much, Karen, and thank you, Ovidu. I'd also like to thank uh, Norma Richardson. I don't know, I, I don't know whether Norma is there, She's the one who, you know, she's a business manager and does so much work. And Moira, right, she's also, she works with Karen and myself. I don't know whether she's here. Please say hi if you are here. And the numbers are going up. I mean, already I see 47 for every second it's going up. So oh, we I have do, almost I, 60 people now, so. Oh, gosh. I, I hope it's not going to break the teams, right? Because <laughs> you don't see this many people, so... So we've been advertising and, uh, you know, so I've been sort of saying such great things. Everybody's been saying great things about Elisa. So, so everyone's anxiously, I don't want to make Elisa nervous. Okay. So I don't even need a, um, to read anything to give an introduction to Elisa, Professor Bertino. So it gives all of us on behalf of UT Dallas and the UT Dallas Grace series, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Elisa Bertino. Uh, Bertino is, I mean, she really needs no introduction. She is the Sam Conte Professor uh, at, at Purdue University. And she is, um, has got an amazing career. She started off after a PhD at University of Pisa in Italy. She then spent time at uh, uh, in, in PISA, the research institute, the famous research institute, and did some sabbaticals at IBM Almaden. And then she joined University of Genoa, and then she had a long career, including as department head at University of Milano. And then she joined Purdue University for the last, I think, uh, how many years? It is about 17, eight, almost 18 years. Yeah. Right. And so <clears throat> she has got so many received so many awards. She's a fellow of IEEE, fellow of ACM, fellow of AAAS, and she's got several awards, the IEEE Computer Society Technical Achievement Award, IEEE Computer Society Kanai Award, ACM SIGSAC Outstanding Contributions Award, and I think she has IEEE, uh, she received the IEEE, uh, it's a very prestigious award, the parent IEEE's uh, Innovation in Societal Infrastructure, and then uh, she also has the IFIP uh, Christian Beckman Award. Oh, I, I mean, I can go on and on. So, but the most important, she, she delivered the Athena Lecture Award. That's sort of like the Turing Award for women, only a very few women, not even, I think, 15 or 16 women. She was, Elisa, I think, was like the 13th or 14th woman to get this uh, Athena Lecture Award. And I wouldn't be surprised if that goes get go, go, evolves into the Turing Award for Elisa. So uh, she also has, we're going to ask her these questions, right, to motivate everyone. She also has in the DBLP, and I'm sure many more because not everything goes on DBLP. She also 
um, has published over 650 top tier conferences, over 350 journals and 100 plus H index and 50,000 citations. So I'm going to stop there. So I'd like to welcome Professor Elisa Bertino and let's just give her a hand for and again, thank you. So please start, Elisa. OK, Bavani, thank you a lot for the introduction. Let me share the content. Um, let me see. Oh, what is, uh, uh, OK, so I think we go to those. Uh, how do we share those three dots, Elisa, you see? OK, is let me see. No, no. Dots, not the dots. I think you go to the arrow. Remember, there's an arrow. Yes, then I'm going there. OK, yeah, and then that share content. Yeah, I know, but I, I wonder why, because I have already the. OK, let me do something. OK, sorry for. Uh... No, because I, I, you know, everyone knows Zoom. Not many people. Karen, can you help with that, please? OK. Can you see? You should be seeing my slide yes, now. We see, we see. We are almost going to see now. Okay. Um, yeah, so, do you see the slide? Or, uh, because yeah. let me. Yeah. Is okay. Now. Yes. Is that okay? Yes. Okay, everyone is okay, right? Pardon? I'm asking everyone. Everyone can see it, right? Yes. OK, so today yeah. I'm very pleased to be here and meeting with you and be part of the GRACE uh, seminars at UT Dallas. It gives me a big honor to give to present my perspective. To start, I'd like to talk a little bit how my career started. So Bavani already introduced uh, something of what I did, but that let me say that this picture was taken at the IBM uh, Alma, the, uh, the San Jose Research Lab in 1982. So I had been out of the university for only two years, was uh, really a long time ago. There was uh, no internet at that time, okay? So basically, and um, I was lucky in a way to get uh, a postdoctoral fellowship at, uh, to go and visit uh, this lab. Now, those fellowships were funded uh, by IBM Italy for one part, IBM Worldwide, and then uh, just a, a small part was funded by uh, the lab where I was going. So I found myself, uh, you know, from Italy all the way to California, a very remote place for me. And, but that was a very important experience. I learned a lot. Let me say to start that they had some postdocs, and this was the team where I was working with. And many of those people have done very fundamental research in data management, like, for example, Bruce, uh, Bruce um, Lindsay, who worked on the recovery system, one who developed the, also the concurrency control management and so forth. And they gave me a problem that was a bit difficult, but they didn't have time to think because they had their own priorities for the project. And they gave me this problem. So I tried to, you know, I thought about the possible solution, but as you can imagine, I was very scared to be in this group with very famous people, they knew a lot of the system. And then uh, uh, I had my solution, but then I thought, OK, I must be very brave, should not be worried. If they don't like my solution, if they don't like my ideas how to solve the problem, I thought, uh, you know, what can happen to me? In the worst case, they will send me back to Italy. But it's nothing bad that will happen to me. OK, so. OK, please don't talk in the background because we are having an important lecture. Please so don't talk in the background. Yeah. So what happened that I say, you know, I really must be not worried. So I. Uh, please stop talking. You are talking in the background. OK, 
sorry. So, so basically, I say, you know, nothing bad will happen to me. I am very optimistic in a way. So I say, I went ahead and presented them my ideas. And they told me, oh, this may work. And then they told me, now you take the code and you implement your solution to extend the actual system. And the code was very big. This was a, the code of the system R, the distributed version of system R. System R was basically the system which developed SQL, prepared the foundations of the relational technology. So that was a very big code. But I was very happy that they kind of, uh, you know, given me this opportunity. After two months, I was able to show a demo of my implementation and everything was working. And at that time, actually, they offered me a permanent position. They told me, if you want to stay here, we, we will offer you a position, we want to hire you. But then at that time, I was very, you know, far away from Italy. I decided to go back to Italy. But that initial experience gave me the more confidence. Confidence in oneself is very important. So then uh, as uh, my scientific career progressed, uh, I was at this uh, research institute is funded by the government until 1990. And during that time, I went one year at, at uh, IBM San Jose. Then uh, later on, I went to a research center in Austin, Texas, and worked on object-oriented technology. And at that time, uh, I started looking more into security, database security. And, but then uh, um, in 1990, I became a professor, to my surprise, actually, because I had applied for the position, but I was not confident that I would be selected. But then I was uh, selected. So I found I was quite young to be a professor, and I had uh, to get funding for my students, uh, teachers, so it was everything new. At that time, during the between the 90 and 93, I started working more and more in security. And at that time, uh, I remember uh, reading all papers by Bavani because Bavani had been working in, in database security much earlier than me. So she had done a very fundamental work like security for object oriented systems. I remember she. Had Is it just we can't hear? OK, so I had the uh, she had the multi level security system, uh, multi level uh, security model. So uh, I was reading her paper uh, on integrity and security. So the work by Bavani had a major impact on my research. After uh, in 1993, I moved to the University of Milan and there I was working more and more on security. And then uh, in a way in uh, around 2001, somebody, the Dean of the College of Science from Purdue, contacted me asking if I was interested in a position as a professor at Purdue. And this was a big surprise to me. And uh, then I decided uh, because of Purdue as a big center on cybersecurity and I wanted to do more work on cybersecurity, I decided to take this chance and kind of took three years of leave of absence from Milan and moved to Purdue where I am still today. Let me say that at Purdue, I moved more and more into security. And the reason is that um, my attitude to research is always to learn from other people. I always think I can learn a lot from research by other people. I remember the first time I met Bavani uh, in a conference after I had read all her papers, I asked her a lot of questions because she was so knowledgeable. I want to learn as much as I could from her. And at Purdue, 
there are a lot of security people. What I noticed in, during my life that changing helps a lot because it helps you to broaden your view, your knowledge, interacting with many different people is very important and helped me a lot in my career. Okay, so this is very important because you need also to understand the recent trends and sometimes just being in a different environment, talking uh, uh, to other people, work on things which are a little bit different, really enhances your research a lot. And as a matter of fact, uh, I always try to expand my, my knowledge and my research, often based on collaborators, collaborations, projects, and so forth. So I believe this is at least critical to be open and always learning. You never stop learning. And uh, um, so uh, that's what uh, motivated me and shaped my career. And also, I am always open to other people's idea. And usually I don't like to talk about my work. I like more to, to listen to the others because I know that I can learn something from them. And what I learn can be applied to my research areas, which is today cybersecurity. So let me move a little bit forward with the sometimes questions that I am asked, okay? So typically people always ask, how do I choose my areas of interest? Okay. So this, uh, the way I choose my areas depends uh, on one side uh, on technology, looking where technology is, is, uh, is moving, the hardware, the networks technology. For example, since uh, five years, I've been working more and more in cellular networks. And this has been motivated because this is an area where there is a lot of uh, evolution in technology. So you have to look also at the technology, the hardware, etc. And so this is really important. And uh, people also ask, which is the greatest challenge and greatest reward in my professional career? And what happened, the greatest challenge was when I was a very junior researcher, so I was 25 years old, I would go to conferences and discuss with very senior people in my area. At that time, I was working on databases. And I had some new ideas that I thought were very nice and would talk to those people. And those people would tell me, no, you know, this doesn't look good. They would try to convince me to work on very well established topics. And of course, since I was very young, I said perhaps they are right. You know, could be that I shouldn't work on those topics. But then later on, I discovered that many of my ideas were right, perhaps a bit too early. So this was a you know, it was a challenge because when you are young, uh, you know, you don't feel very confident in your idea. But at least later on, I was able to see that some of my ideas were good. And today, when I am interested in something, I just go and work on it. But also, since I've become senior and started the supervising students, I always make a very conscious effort to carefully listen to their ideas, encourage them to pursue them. So sometimes I don't impose a research direction or ideas on some students. I really see what they want to do. Very careful to make sure that they explore their ideas without uh, you know, imposing my, no, my own preferences or a research direction on them. In some cases, those younger researchers go ahead and they then become very strong, come up with the brilliant result. And this is probably my main reward, see these younger people flourish based on their own idea, not on mine. That's what I want, what I like a lot, okay? 
So that is really a major reward because it's very important for younger people to have a very strong research program and where they know uh, which are the direction they have shaped the direction of, 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 your, of their research rather than being based on my idea. Of course, another question, how do I decide that to pursue a career in academia versus, versus industry? Both environments are very rewarding. We are lucky that in our field there are a lot of opportunities. I decided to work in academia because I wanted to be free to set up my research agenda and to really work on the topics on which I believe and which I am passionate. But I also listen a lot to industry. So I have a collaboration so with them and also with industry. I never try to, to impose my ideas. So I really want to listen to what their problems are, what are the directions they are interested in. And as a result, sometimes I ended up working on certain topics which I was not even thinking to work on, even in hardware, because a company was interested in a certain issues with hardware and I say, OK, you know, I never worked on it, but I'll try. I want to explore. I want to understand. So that that has been kind of some key, uh, let's say, insight from my careers. Now let me move to the actual topic of my talk, which is privacy. In the area where we have a lot of technologies, which uh, they include the big data, 5G cellular networks, the new generation of 6G, Internet of Things, AI, and so forth. And those technologies are very powerful, and that's why we live in very exciting times for our field. And with all these technologies combined, we can collect and process a lot of data, extract the knowledge and the recommendation out of this data and making devices control system uh, and more intelligent. And what is particularly important is that with those technologies, we can basically today um, you know, assure improve security, not only, uh, let's say, cyber security, which is my area, we can improve health security, which today is becoming very important. We can do a lot of uh, monitoring and preventing the disease, the spreading of diseases. Uh, we can do evidence-based health care. And we have many other forms of security, like uh, food and water security, for example, homeland protection and so forth. But I would like to claim that uh, with our technologies, we can accelerate the progress against the world critical challenges. So our technology can really do a lot. And uh, a very interesting example is uh, the one on how, for example, IoT and AI techniques could help with the pandemics. So last year, when I was looking at what companies were doing, uh, for example, for contact tracing, uh, people uh, came up with a lot of different ideas, such as, uh, uh, for example, managing and tracking physical interaction among individuals using certain devices. For example, if an individual is too close to another one, a device which is weird, would ring an alarm and people would also analyze videos to uh, to for example detect whether two people are too close and so forth so there, there is really a lot of technology which again is obtained by combining ai iot data analysis and so forth but on the other side all those uh, nice applications which again will be cre are critical for our society require collecting a lot of data and this introduces a lot of privacy threat and especially the environment of mobile systems has a lot of different privacy threat and those threats arise at various levels in our system and in various components so we have uh, 
for example, out of privacy issue on cellular networks, for example, matching uh, mobile users to access point at the physical layer, traceability via catching the uh, international mobile subscriber identifier. We even have a very sophisticated attacks based on paging occasion. Then uh, data, the collected data by themselves can introduce a lot of risks, mainly because the different data can be linked together. There is a lack of security in the management of data. Data are not very well protected. Often they are also used improperly, not for the purposes for which the data was collected. We have uh, a lot of vulnerabilities in mobile applications. I'll show you some uh, recent data that we collected just to show you the problem. And then we have uh, more applications which collect more data than, 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 than they should. We have a lot of attacks now in uh, to um, AI and machine learning models. A typical attack is an inversion attack by which from a trained model, an attacker can learn some information about the data used to train the model. And this is a problem when some of those data is privacy sensitive. In addition, people have shown that even when you deploy, uh, let's say, protections, against those machine learning inferences that can be done from those models, sometimes privacy is not even for all the users. Certain minorities are less protected. And then there are variable devices and continuous data stream. So I'm going to briefly show some of the attacks and some of based on our research. So the first example, this is a very sophisticated attack, which is typical of, of wireless network. So what happened very briefly, that when you are not using the mobile phone, the phone goes in what is called a low power mode, which means that the phone goes to sleep and that this is done to save energy, okay? But periodically, uh, the phone wakes up to, to check if there are incoming messages. So the base station periodically broadcast a message containing certain records. For example, those records include the identifier of a given, uh, let's say a temporary identifier of a given uh, subscriber with the corresponding type of, uh, of uh, let's say, request, whether it is uh, a message or a, a call. And so the phone can wake up periodically and check in these, uh, in these uh, records if there is anything for the phone. If this is the case, the phone will wake up from the low power mode and then will accept the call or receive the message. So this is called a paging protocol. So the idea is very easy. Again, the phone sleeps once in a while, usually it wakes up about every 1.28 seconds to check if there are those incoming records, you know, calls for the phone. And then notice that uh, the, the standards requires that uh, um, the, the identifiers used in uh, those messages are not the actual international mobile subscriber identity. It's a temporary one, which is uh, issued to protect the privacy. So nobody can track the user by intercepting those paging messages. Okay. So this looks good for privacy, but actually we found a serious problem here. So we found that basically uh, uh, the phone, as I said before, has to wake up periodically and wakes up in what is called a given index within the radio frame. And this index is fixed and is obtained in a deterministic way 
from the binary encoding of the last eight bits of the IMCI. The IMCI is what you have in your SIM card and includes the uh, basically the ident identity of the subscriber. So it's very sensitive information. And basically we discovered that, that uh, the way this uh, time, let's say, this index when the phone has a two week up is obtained from those uh, bits. So as you can see, for example, for this IMCI, the frame index will be 11. For this other two, the frame will be uh, 22. Okay, so we discovered that this flow, so which means uh, this is a privacy issue. And then uh, later on, uh, by exploiting this vulnerability, we came up with a very simple attack by which uh, we can discover when a user is in a given area, where basically a user is connected to a given cell towers. And doing that, uh, even if in theory, the IMCI is protected, we can still basically bypass the privacy security given by this temporary mobile identifier and locate the user. Okay, so as you can see in, in this diagram, we can easily identify when a user is located in a certain cell tower by sending a lot of silent calls to this user and we will see a spike in the distribution of the paging record. If there is a, such a spike, then the user is located in that location. Again, the location is uh, the area around the cell tower. But this is one example. Now, a real problem that we have here, not only if with this type of attack, is in general, uh, we found that this attack in a way based on our intuition. But companies, when they see this type of attack, they really want to find having more systematic approaches to find uh, those attacks. Because in general, it's not just to find the one attack because of intuition. We want to have a systematic approach to find, for example, those type of side channel attacks. And this is uh, an important problem that today we have in security. You read a lot of attacks, but again, there is no methodology that one can apply to more uh, systematically analyze uh, those protocols and find the uh, vulnerabilities. Okay. Now let me move, and this will be very quickly, to the other problem. So as I said before, data often is anonymized or is cleaned by removing private information before releasing this data set, for example, to researchers or to other interested parties. However, the real problem is that there are so many other data sets that is very easy to link uh, uh, records which are anonymized with other records which are known. This is uh, the famous um, attack shown by Latania Sweeney, who is a colleague of Bavani and me, and she uh, discovered this when she did her PhD at MIT. So what she did, she got this uh, data set released by an hospital. As you can see, this data set uh, was uh, cleaned, let's say, by removing uh, information which identifies specific individual, like social security number, name. Okay, but she was able then to buy a public voter data set. And basically, as you can see, by correlating the record based on uh, uh, DOB, sex, and zip, she could re identify the actual individual of uh, one of these records. She's shown this for other individuals. Okay. But the problem is that uh, today, the problem has become much worse. Why? Because our data move everywhere. Okay. And uh, when they move everywhere, those parties where our data flow may have other data and they can still try to link back, like we have seen before, data which perhaps is anonymous, 
with data which is said is not anonymous, which has our uh, identifiers. Here is a very interesting uh, map. This was again prepared by Latania Suini some years ago, actually several years ago, where she tracked very carefully where our medical data goes. And if you look uh, in this slide, you will see this is quite impressive. When I saw, I really <laughs> jumped on my chair. I said, oh, you know, I couldn't believe that this data would flow in so many, to so many parties. And in some cases, uh, when uh, the edges which are uh, uh, dotted, which are dashed, uh, they don't include uh, your name. The, the edges which instead uh, are not uh, dotted are continuous. Those are uh, cases of data which include the identifiers of the individuals. So this is quite... Uh, uh, quite impressive and I believe that creating similar maps for other categories of data could be very important to make people aware that one has to be careful with his or her own data because this data move in many different places. Then I want to mention that uh, 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 we have also unsecure applications, especially mobile applications. So those are the result of two studies that we did uh, quite uh, recently. Uh, because the problem with this mobile application, that they are unsecure. And uh, what happened that uh, to have a privacy, you must have a security. If data is not well protected, then uh, your privacy cannot be assured. Okay, then on top of security, privacy requires as many additional requirements. Okay. But at least data has to be protected. And we found by looking at about 13,000 applications in the Google Play that many applications, as you can see, we had a total of uh, um, quite a lot of them, which didn't check the certificates very well. So we found that some, and this was a number of 934 over 13,000, did not even check the certificate. So this was the case in which the application was looking login and password authentication to an application on a web server. And in this case, it's important that the mobile application checks the certificate from the web server to make sure to be talking to the legitimate web server. You don't want your application with your data talking to a malicious web website, you want to be sure that you are talking to the correct one. And to our surprise, a lot of them would not even verify the certificate at all. Some, for example, only checked whether the certificates were signed by an invalid certification authorities. They didn't check, for example, whether the certificate was uh, expired, for example, or was self-signed. Now, as you can see, we had to analyze a lot of applications. We had the tool to automatically scan the application and find those vulnerabilities, because we couldn't do this by hand. And today there is a lot of other people are more and more developing such tools. Then later on, we looked at one-time password. Um, typically, those are used in two-factor authentications, where you enter, for example, a password, but you also receive a token on your mobile phone. So here we analyzed 3,000 of those apps, and we found a lot of vulnerabilities. For example, we found that even though the guidelines for those type of authentication based on those one-time tokens, indicated that those tokens should only be valid 10 minutes. In some cases, we found the tokens which were valid one day. Okay, so you could reuse the same token after one day. In some cases, they were very short. 
In other cases, they were not random. We found several cases in which one, if you were to look at the token and the next one token, they would look very different from each other. But when you would look at the binary representation of those strings, it turned out that the next token was obtained from the previous one by shift the string, the binary string of one position. So which means an attacker could easily predict the next value very easily because of the way they were generated. So they were not random. Okay, so we found all those vulnerabilities. It's clear that uh, if we have applications so weak, uh, privacy will be really relying on very weak foundation. Then a lot of, many, many years ago, we also did a study, this was already actually uh, eight, uh, seven years ago, where we looked at 250 applications in Google Play. At that time, there were much less than you know, the numbers of applications you have today. And we found that a lot of them always were trying to get the contact information, access which were the contact on the phone, and access the location. And this was happening even for applications that were supposed to do something else, in which really the contact information was not relevant from, for the application. We call them curious applications. They want to learn more than they should. So uh, finally, so based on this, uh, you know, when you talk to people in our field, and perhaps Bavani can uh, tell us her view, but people say, oh, privacy is gone. We should really forget about it. There is no, no hope. And, uh, you know, it's uh, nice for, for me to look at what the situation was in 1993. When, uh, when you were, uh, you know, browsing on the internet or doing interactions, you could really be believed to be anonymous and nobody would know who you were. But today, even if you try to be anonymous, it's very easy for uh, you know, parties to understand uh, who you are, to figure it out, okay? So, however, I believe that even though we may think that privacy is long gone, actually there is, uh, over the years, there has been a lot of interest in privacy. And I must say, consumers are very keen on privacy. I'll tell you something more on that. So what can we do? So we say, you know, privacy seems to be very difficult. I have shown you in many ways in which privacy can be breached on the cellular networks, on the application, by linking data and so forth. But today we have a lot of privacy preserving technology. Research has progressed a lot and a lot of research, again, is done by the security team at UT Dallas and many other institutions. So we have a lot of privacy preserving techniques, including protections, for example, against certain attacks to AI model. We have uh, uh, approaches to train, for example, deep neural network using differential privacy to ensure the privacy. We have a network anonymizer. Those are very well known, like Tor has been introduced many years ago. A network anonymizer will protect your uh, uh, IP address so nobody is able to figure it out from which IP address you are, uh, let's say, uh, sending messages. Uh, there is more and more work on uh, secure multi-party computation technique and uh, privacy preserving data mining. And I would like to mention uh, uh, Murat, Professor Murat Kantarsoglu, who is at UD Dallas. He did the fundamental work on privacy preserving data mining using secure multi-party computation. His work has been really a pioneer in this area has been done, I believe, more than 15 years ago. Uh, then we have uh, many other techniques, uh, some of which we have uh, uh, introduced many years ago. 
And to my surprise, when we came up with those techniques, uh, we didn't think that would be interesting, but I really wanted to do that research. So I did, and I feel that today this research is very relevant. So I'm trying just to be very quick so we can conclude and see if there are questions. But so we did this work to show you some example of technology that one can also use to protect privacy. This has to do with streaming data. So as you can see on the left, the technology is progressing a lot. We have a lot of wearable devices. They go from micro devices to very small micro devices, okay, including patches, embedded devices. And uh, there is a lot of research also in, uh, in uh, for example, in material engineering, coming up with sensors which use a different variety of materials, can collect the data and so forth. So the idea was you have all those uh, devices streaming data all the time. So they move uh, with you because uh, typically those are variable devices. And those data, however, have to be um, analyzed by different parties. So we had this idea that we could have uh, parties interested in uh, accessing those data for various purposes through some queries. So those would be data streaming and parties could access those data for various purposes. And the goal was uh, how can we allow users to specify their own privacy preferences? Because uh, when dealing with privacy, users may have a different uh, preference. So users, oh, a user may be very restrictive. Another user um, is more relaxed and may allow different parties to access his or her own data. Here is a very simple example where you have the two different users, John and Mary, have different preferences. For example, Mary doesn't want her data to be shared with the nurse on duty, while John is fine with that. They don't want anyone else, you know, malicious user to access their data. They like their data to be accessed by parties in charge of improving their health and so forth. So the question was then, how can we allow users to specify their privacy preferences, which also keep in mind that their preferences can be context dependent. This was a sub fundamental study done by Ellen Nissenbaum, who is very well known, where she said privacy is contextual. Depending on our context, our privacy preference may change. So we came up with an approach by which uh, we can dynamically change the privacy preferences um, while data is being transmitted. And this is achieved by adding uh, our privacy preference to the data themselves. And the preference, once it is in a stream, will apply to all the subsequent data. And then the, there is the server, which then will dispatch the data according to the privacy preferences. But the real question was, how can the user put those preferences? Because they may change over time. Here we see examples of different preferences expressed as a rule by user. A user may say, when everything is normal, only my doctor can access the data. Then we have another rule, another preference, which says if something looks suspicious, for example, my heart rate is becoming too high, allow a nurse on duty to see my data. And uh, if I am in an imminent danger, allow any medical personnel to access my data. Actually, a case was reported two years ago where because of these wearable devices and the sending of this data, somebody was having an heart attack and this person was saved because these data were transmitted immediately. Somebody was able to access and the person was saved. But the question is, how do we inject, how does the user insert those data, those rules? We, at that time, we thought different ideas, but then today we could use a machine learning to learn those rules automatically 
inject them inside our stream. Because remember, we could have a, 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 you know, um, a tool which can analyze a different body signal, understand that there is a something not to work, you know, something is, a, you know, is, is a kind of anomalous and somebody else has to be notified, can then put the proper preference inside of the stream. So this was an example which we did many, many years ago, but today this could be feasible. This is a case where we can have health security or health to be secure and answered, but still having our privacy preferences implemented. So we skip this one. And because I want to come to the, the key point here. So it seems that we have a lot of technology from the very kind of strange, like the ones I presented, to very well-known techniques like SMC, anonymized. But what is the problem? The real problem, and this has been, uh, um, so somebody who's very well known for doing research on customer user privacy preferences, as I analyzed a lot of data, the real problem is that users really are interested in privacy. They want privacy, but they find the privacy very difficult to manage. So if you look at my previous example, suppose that we want to have a very high privacy environment in a mobile, suppose that we go around with our phones, a lot of devices, wearable devices, to be private, uh, there is not a single technique that we can use. We will need to use a network anonymizer, making sure to use applications which don't have those bugs in authentication, those vulnerabilities. We will need to always uh, uh, specify our privacy preferences and change them depending on our context. So people find this very difficult to manage, very expensive. So we will need a privacy in depth. And by the way, I want to report you some very interesting data and you know, finding. At the beginning of this year, the Apple, in the last version of the, their mobile operating system, iOS, and this was the version 14.5, they introduced the a new option. Basically, um, the users now can opt out from technology which allows other parties to track them. So users could say, I don't want to be tracked by specific technology which tracks the user in order for publicity to send advertisement. Now, they were expecting that only 40% of the people would opt in to have a distressing. Instead, they found months later that only 4% of the user opt in to be tracked. The rest didn't want to be tracked. Okay, So they had done a survey before this new release was uh, introduced and they were expecting that 40% of the people would opt in to be tracked. Instead, only 4% opt in. This tells us that people are very interested in privacy. They want privacy, but again, it's very difficult to manage. It would be good to have a holistic environment where I can click something and say I want to be private and then the system takes care of applying all the various technology to make my privacy holistic. But there is a very important question, which is in many cases, we have a problem of personal privacy, privacy versus collective safety. The COVID tracing was a very well known case. Tracing was very important, but people wanted their privacy. But sometimes one has to trade off privacy versus safety. So the real question here is how can we make people able to make their choices about this question? Okay. How can we make possible to reconcile two goals which are very against each other? We want to have a privacy, but we want also to have a collective safety. 
For example, in my case, I believe that sharing my data for medical research is very important. But I wanted to be sure that my data is well protected by the medical institution. And if they explain me what privacy and security techniques to use, I understand, I can assess, but many people don't. Okay, so I can say, yes, this institution will do a good job in protecting my data. I can give them my data, but other people don't have the technical knowledge. That's really a major issue. And I believe that, you know, I don't have an answer to this, but this is something which is important. And in my view, at least a data transparency, at least we want to know how our data is used, where this data goes is very important. Also having clear policies about the use of data will be critical. On top of this, we need to have strong data security, high assurance data security, and keep working on more efficient privacy preserving techniques. And with this, uh, it's uh, the end of my talk, and uh, probably I can uh, stop uh, presenting. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you very much for the wonderful talk. And it was very informative. Let's give her a hand. I think we have, yeah, I don't know what it's talking to press. So now question time. I have some questions, but are there other questions that, you know, uh, if you're, you can type your questions in the chat or you can answer, you know, you can ask the question. I see someone has, Karen, do you want to moderate? I don't know how to do this very well. Well, I can read the, the chat, but for the moment I, I don't see. I just saw somebody who said uh, to thank me for the talk. I don't see any. We do have someone that sign. raised their hand, so. Uh, if you have a question, please go ahead. Okay, so I think Sanda Harabaju, right? Sanda, okay. do you have your hands raised? Okay. Hello, uh, Sanda, do you have a question? Hello, hello, hello Professor. Um, uh, in this, tra in this uh, very well-known trade-off, uh, this uh, personal privacy versus the collective safety, uh, I mean, it is uh, kind of a trade-off between uh, individual rights versus the public order. Uh, yeah, public safety, yeah. Uh, sometimes, yes, public safety is under the scope of the public order, would be, I think, uh, in the yeah. governmental uh, thought. And uh, as far as I see, uh, from the very early times of the history, in general, uh, the, the winner is the uh, public order. It could be public safety, public health, and so on. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, in this uh, near technology, uh, these IoT and the other stuff, and it uh, goes to emerge. Uh, I think that the the winner, uh, I mean, would be extremely this uh, collective safety uh, and other purposes. But uh, what what do you think about this uh, uh, this issue, this trade off uh, regarding the near future, uh, near uh, ten years? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, okay. So uh, this trade off uh, is important, but uh, this trade off, uh, I don't have a clear view myself of what could be the, the right trade off. But for us, we must enable the, this trade off, must make possible to make it. This means that we need to come up with techniques to protect the data strongly. So, which means if you have a lot of IoT devices or devices that you wear, you must be assured that this data cannot be breached while being transmitted to other parties. Okay, that's, that's what we can do. Okay, and then you have to find the ways to explain the people. An example like this data map, which I've shown you, People can see where the data go, and perhaps they, the people may say, uh, say, no, I don't want my data to be transmitted here and there. You can explain to them that in some cases this data transmission is mandatory because it's required by the law. Then the agencies receiving this type of data should show be transparent, you know, say this is the way we protect the data, 
what we do with this data, for which purposes. At least you know more, you will be more conscious of what happened to your data. And then you can judge. Myself, because I am, for example, very privacy conscious, I really, uh, I never am on the social networks. I don't want to cite names, but really avoid that for a long time because I didn't trust them. And indeed, you know, recent happenings have shown that you don't want to trust. But for certain things we cannot do without, okay? For healthcare, you may want to have those devices. And that's our role is. Our role is to have tools to support the transparency. Define what transparency is. This requires involving people from laws, policies, governmental, you know, um, from this area, because this has to do with, with government as well. Okay. Yeah, that was very interesting. I have some comments, but I want much. to hear from others. So, Senda, there are some other questions. So, we do. Yeah. Yes. So, Senda. Is... Yeah, Senda, you are next. Yeah. Prima di tutto, buonasera. Hi, how do you speak in <laughs> uh, My question is a little bit more, uh, I'm not technical in the security area, but it's something that uh, I was very amazed, uh, probably all of you have heard about the fact that a lot of hospitals recently have been attacked and hackers would block uh, all that uh, information, right? Uh, and a lot of hospitals are using this very big uh, electronic health records like EPIC, for instance. And EPIC has all these capabilities that doctors can exchange data yeah. between institutions. Uh, I do not know about, I, I'm, I'm just wondering if you know, these hospitals that have been hacked, uh, they did not have EPIC or they were, the, the systems were much more simple, not robust. Do you know what happened to those? No, that, no. Uh, but uh, talking about ransomware, yeah. okay, uh, the real problem with ransomware, to be honest, is that, um, uh, you know, uh, usually security is not only a problem of having a bug in your system or some vulnerability, it's because the security is not managed well. A lot of cases, the problem is like if you say, I, for example, uh, don't lock my house. I have all the mechanisms, just I, I forget to lock my house. Okay? And then, of course, if you forget that, uh, that's what happened. A lot of attacks really are because there is no good management of security. And the reason why, because the security is, a, you know, security is a cost. Okay. So you need uh, to understand the organizational policies, what the organization want to do. For example, they may say, you know, you have to change the password every two months. So they have all those policies. Then you need uh, to enforce them. And this requires a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of work. So a lot of those, I talked to a company which really investigate, helps customer who have had the ransomware. And they told me a lot of companies don't have what they call the good security hygiene, which means that they really, you know, don't, don't manage the security. If they were, a lot of attacks wouldn't succeed. That's the problem, okay? Uh, so that's what, and that's why it's not a surprise that a lot of initial attacks happen to hospitals, schools, government, so th those are organizations which don't have a lot of funding for IT staff. They're usually not very technical, okay? And that's why they were the first to be targeted. Now, more sophisticated, even the pipelines, which uh, from Texas to, you know, bring the gasoline is another example because of this type of energy infrastructures they were isolated, but now they're all connected to internet. They're becoming digitalized. And that's now where they have the attacks, but they are not really very secure yet because they were connected to internet much later than many other sectors. So, that's the problem. So you think that to solve this problem in general, we'll have to have a lot of experts such that everybody can hire some expertise to make sure that the locks of the house are, you know. Yeah, well, to be honest, this is a major problem. I believe that techniques like the ones that, again, the team of Bavan is developing using AI and machine learning could help to automate some of those issues. That's what we needed to try. Otherwise, uh, 
you know, won't be manageable, to be honest. Okay? Especially when there is a, this idea now of zero trust architecture, which has been mentioned by the executive order by the president in, uh, in about security dimension deployment of zero trust architecture. What this means is putting a lot of controls everywhere in our system networks, but managing all the putting those controls, managing them will require a lot of work. So that's where we need to come up with uh, uh, no, automatic solutions in a way, because otherwise it would be very difficult to manage this by hand. I think there was a comment uh, by somebody, but I see oh, if I can. Uh, Oh, okay, there was a comment say companies do not have uh, much incentive uh, for privacy or, or security. Uh, that's an excellent question. So the question is by uh, Richard, uh, say companies don't have uh, much incentive to privacy or security. Well, ransomware is a case where they have a big incentive <laughs> because uh, those ransom, they cost millions to those companies. And now the government is trying e even uh, to crack down a little bit on ransomware, but still uh, companies pay a lot. And uh, to be honest, when companies have privacy breaches now, they can be sued by consumers. So now they, this is, is going to be a problem, okay, that uh, privacy breaches this happened to Equifax when they had a major data breach uh, and they had to pay a lot of money to their customer. Plus now customer will uh, not trust those companies a lot. But I agree, you know, there must be also uh, government regulation as well. One example is the G GDPR, okay? But keep in mind another thing. The data is really the golden mine today because, uh, you know, data have a lot of value for business, especially because now we have a machine learning, we can extract a lot of important information. That's why companies have an incentive to protect their data. If they lose their data, they will lose a lot of intellectual properties. And indeed, uh, a lot of attacks are motivated on one side by ransomware, financial gains. Other attacks are motivated by espionage. The solar wind attack was motivated not by ransomware, by financial, but to get valuable information, to do espionage. And the espionage can be industrial espionage, can be used in cyber warfare in the future. Okay, that is a very strong incentive for companies. But again, my point of view is that uh, incentives are good to have, and that can be even given by the government, certain you know, laws or whatever. But we as researchers must provide the tools to manage security, because otherwise uh, the problem will be very difficult for companies. So okay. we have another question, Elisa. The previous one was from the one you answered from Richard uh, Gachelin. Uh, the yes. other question from Patak. Excellent presentation, Professor Bertino. Is there any research movement to make data self-sufficient using blockchain oh. for privacy? Uh, that I wouldn't know, uh, to be honest, uh, because uh, uh, blockchain is used for a lot of things. It's used for everywhere. I'm not aware of anything, to be honest. Uh, I'm not sure what means data self-sufficient, exactly, yeah. yeah. So, uh, Adia, Adia, Ovidu, do you have any questions? Because I, I have I have some questions, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, I'll definitely have, but, uh, you know, just to make sure that we don't take too much of Eliza's time here, I'd like yeah. to, to see whether she can point out one of the major roadblocks she has encountered in her career. Points at which she, well, main point was she, so maybe she could uh, stumble or she just felt that, you know, something it's, uh, is becoming a big obstacle in, in her pursuit of, of her career dreams. Okay, this happens actually uh, when I was uh, in Italy at this Italian National Research Council. This was uh, when I was in my between the uh, the uh, 1980 and 99. 
because of what happened, I was the youngest in the group. All the rest, they were men, okay? And so what was happening, uh, probably this was natural. My boss, who was a very nice guy, didn't think. But whenever, uh, so we had the various projects, and whenever there was a something that nobody wanted to do, that would tell me, Elisa, you do this, okay? And I was getting frustrated. And even at a certain point, there was uh, some work to do on user interfaces, which I didn't like to do because the user interfaces, to do this work well, you must be expert of cognitive science, okay? I didn't like it just to think, you know, put some icons somewhere on the screen. I say, to do this well, I must uh, know cognitive science, which I don't intend to study, I don't want to do. But then uh, I had uh, to do, you know, they, my boss would tell me, okay, you do this. Another time there was a nice problem. I said, I want to work on this. And my boss said, okay, you work on this. Then a senior guy came, no, I want to work on that. So my boss told me, would you mind if he works on this, you do something else. So at the beginning, uh, this was, get, was not as was getting me frustrated, but then I realized that I had a different attitude. I say, okay, that's fine, but I'll take this opportunity to learn something. I will have to learn something of whatever I work on, even though I don't like, I still want to do a good job and learn something. And this actually helped me a lot because I learned the things that later become useful to me, okay? So always try that in general, when you have something negative, you can learn something out of something negative. You always have to look from this point of view. Okay. So I just have a follow up question to Ovidus. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. I mean, we should learn from Elisa. So another question is, you know, you have got, as I said, 650 plus conferences, actually many more you know, 300 in DBLP, 350 plus journals, and you've been so, I tell everyone, so consistent. At six o'clock, you are there at your desk. I never see any emails from you after 10 o'clock, and you're right, Ovidu, that's why we need to finish quickly. So, how have you, you have all these collaborations, how have you accomplished all this, and some pointers to our junior, especially our students and our junior faculty, because they have time to adjust their methods and their habits so that they can be successful. Okay, the reason why I learned from several people, one from Bavani, because when I was very young, she was telling me it's very important each day to read some research paper, not to only focus on administrative. She was saying, for example, at six o'clock, one can take a time and read the paper, a new paper. So, and also my boss, uh, when I was at the U, you know, in Austin, in this MCC, my boss used, even though it was very busy, I can see every day would devote the time to read the one or two papers. It was very quick. I saw how you could scan, read the paper, get ideas, okay? And also another person once told me, that he used that he was a professor in Stanford and he told me I teach at nine o'clock in the morning so then I have the rest of the day free to do my research and I thought that teaching early in the morning was a good idea but in any case uh, that's the way I do I learned from several people the reason why I collaborate with many different people, because uh, as I said before, for me, it's critical to learn from other people. So collaborating with other people, I learn from them, okay? I feel myself to be always a student, and even uh, somebody junior than me, I'm sure they know more than me. So when I talk to them, I try to extract, uh, I ask a lot of questions because I, I, I want to take advantage, okay? And, uh, but then I end up collaborating with them because then I ask questions, we discuss and so forth. And for me, it's a way to learn. I don't like just reading 200 papers. Okay? I just uh, try to interact with people a lot. Thank and you so good. much, Elisa. Thank you. And I think, uh, yeah, so at this time, let's give her a hand and I'll, I'll leave it to Karen and Ovidu for their closing remarks, okay? Thank you so Thank much. Thank you a lot for the questions. I'll wrap up. Karen? 
thank you so much. Uh, this is a uh, wonderful information in the technical part of your talk. And here at the end, I really enjoyed your your advice to to students to never stop being students. That's excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Dr. Dasku, do you have anything to add? Just like to thank Alisa again. It was uh, quite impressive. I like the combination of uh, personal stories with uh, the technical side. Obviously, there are lots of things to be done in cybersecurity, and we'll keep in touch with uh, with Alisa, and we'll continue to collaborate and uh, help each other. Thank you very much, again, Alisa. It's a great pleasure to see you again. Yeah. Karen Dose, thank you so much for an amazing presentation. So more comments are coming. So and then we will uh, put this into the UT. Uh, Michelle is recording everything and then she will post this uh, UT Dallas uh, uh, website, YouTube. It's nothing secret was said. So. <laughs> <laughs> we can have it. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Enjoy and have a good night. Thank you all for attending. Thank, thank you. you. We yeah. have a record yeah. breaking here. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.